morning, everyone, and thank you for attending today. We really appreciate your attendance. So today we're going to discuss the BIRAD imaging portfolio, and we're going to look at the stain-free Western blotting workflow, and then we're going to have a total protein normalization demo. It will just be a short demo, but I just want to remind people that on YouTube, there is a BIRAD laboratories page, and on there, you can find a whole lot of information regarding the different products that BioRad has. So for Image Lab software, there are quite a few videos that you can use um, when looking at those, um, that Image Lab software. So today we're going to look at a quick introduction. Then we're going to look at the stain-free Western blot workflow. Then we'll look at normalization. And then we'll do a little bit on total protein normalization. Then we will discuss reagents for stain-free, some marketing collateral, so our BioRad Academy that you can make use of, what to do with your extra time, and then possibly a summary but we don't have to do the summary as you will have most of the information beforehand already. <clears throat> so today we will show you how you can spend five to six hours less performing Western blood experiments. So introduction, Western blotting workflow, I'm sure you are all familiar with um, resolving proteins on an acrylamide gel. Then you transfer the proteins to a membrane which can be nitrocellulose, PVDF, or low fluorescence PVDF. And low fluorescence PVDF is recommended for stain-free Western blotting. And then you do your immunodetection to detect your target of interest. So BIRAD uh, has a Western blotting workflow. We provide products for sample preparation, electrophoresis, so your fast cast gels, which are very quick to polymerize, your TGX, Trisk glycine extended shelf life, precast gels, there's some stains, but you won't have to use stains if you're gonna go the total protein normalization route. And then transfer, obviously nitrocellulose transfer, PBDF and low fluorescence PBDF membranes and buffers and paper. And then your detection, we have primary antibodies, secondary antibodies, and detection reagents, so ECL and ECL max. And then your image analysis using either a Chemidoc or a Chemidoc MP, which allows you to do, and we'll have a look at that a bit later, which allows you to do uh, fluorescence and chemiluminescence, the Chemidoc MP. And then the image lab software, it's free to download off the BIRAD website. All you need to do is log in and register on the website, and then you will be able to download the Image Lab software. So adoption of Western blotting over the last 40 years. Um, Western blot is a consistent and steady uh, technique at around eight or nine percent over the last 30 years. And BIRAD did a publication review where 70% of all the papers published in the Journal of Biological Chemistry in 2016 included Western blot data in their research. And a lot of labs in South Africa and probably in other parts of Sub-Sahara, West and East Africa are, are still doing Western blots today. So Sidney Brenner said, progress in science depends on new techniques new discoveries and new ideas, probably in that order. And he won the Nobel Prize in Physiology in 2002. So the stain-free, now we're gonna have a look at the stain-free Western blotting workflow. So the traditional workflow is often, you have to prepare your gels and then you have to run them. It can take over an hour. Um, you then do your electrophoresis, which can take an hour to run, transfer, depending one, one hour or two hours, antibody incubation, 
five hours, imaging analysis. And then if you're using housekeeping proteins, you have to strip and reprobe. Often reprobing um, is, an, is an additional step and can take another five hours or so. So is this reflective of your workflow? How long does it take? Can you confirm at each step? So can you confirm after you've run the gel, if the gel is run properly? Can you check to see that the proteins have transferred from the gel onto the blood? And can you identify problems early? So here we have someone doing Western blots and uh, 8 a.m. they do their sample extraction, 10 a.m. they run the gels, 12, uh, 8 a.m., uh, sorry, 10 a.m., 12 p.m., 2 to 3 p.m., 6 p.m., and 7 p.m. You don't have anything to show after a whole day's work. That happened to me numerous times. I once dropped my gel and it shattered into a whole lot of different pieces and I couldn't put it together. In fact, I couldn't find some of the pieces that went under the desk. And um, I often had, not all the time, but I did get Westerns to work. But some of the times it was uh, a little bit um, annoying at the end of the day after you put so much work in. So stain-free Western blotting workflow. So we have power packs and different types of power packs. We have the mini protein, protein system and the criterion system for bigger gels. Next to that is the Transplot Turbo, which allows you to do very fast transfers. But it only allows you to do fast transfers if you're using precast gels, TGX, Trisoclycine extended precast gels, or if you are using a fast cast kit from Biorad. And then lastly, we've got the Chemidoc Imager or the Chemidoc MP. Chemidoc MP allows fluorescence and chemiluminescence, whereas the Chemidoc just does fluorescence. So the Biorad V3 workflow or the stain-free workflow, you do electrophoresis, possibly using a trisglycine extended stain-free gel, criterion cell chemidoc MP imaging system, and you can run those gels in 20 to 30 minutes. Then you can have a look at the gel to make sure that it's run properly. Then you do your transfer, transplot turbo transfer system and the Chemidoc MP imaging system, which can take three to 10 minutes. <clears throat> but just a, a caution word is if you are, if you took the image of the gel post pre-transfer and you visualized it for one second, you need to use the same one second for imaging the gel post-transfer. And then you do your antibody incubations, clarity, Western ECL substrate, and maybe primary and secondary antibodies from Biorad. And then you get your stain-free blot image. And then you can do your imaging and analysis, Chemidoc MP imaging system, uh, 10 to 15 minutes. So the total time it's taken you is about six hours. And you can view your chemiluminescent image, or you can use target proteins with fluorescence. <clears throat> so how does the stain-free technology work? Well, there's a molecule in this um, TGX stain-free gels, or the fast-cast stain-free option, called trichloroethanol. And under UV radiation, it enables the reaction within a gel. So that trichloroethanol under UV radiation binds to tryptophan residues and adds a 58 Dalton moiety to the residue. It doesn't have any impact on transferring the proteins to the gel or to the membrane or in running the, the protein gels. And it is fluorescent. So this is just a 
running a stain-free gel, you can see we can run it quite fast. Obviously, this is sped up a little bit, but you can run these stain-free gels, TGX stain-free, in about 20 to 25 minutes. And they're already prepared for you. Then you do your gel activation. And there is a program on the Chemidoc MP and on the Chemidoc, and even on the Gel Doc Go, which allows you to do a 45 second activation, which allows the trichloroethanol to bind to tryptophan residues um, in the protein. And then you have your image. So the stain-free image of the gel pre-transfer, the trihalo compound is activated in the gel and is covalently bound to tryptophan residues. Post-transfer, a mirror image of the total protein is present on the blot. And just remember, if you processing the, if you're imaging the post-transfer gel, if the first image you took for one second, then you need to use the same imaging one second so that the, otherwise the imaging system will be looking for protein in a gel and you'll get bright bands. So you want to make sure that you use the one second activation that you took for the first gel. Transfer efficiency can be verified by re-imaging the gel post transfer. Stain-free blots are best observed on low fluorescence PBDF membrane and illumination by trans-UV to excite total protein. So it's very important that your imaging system has trans-UV because there are some imaging systems that don't have trans-UV light, and then you cannot use those for the stain-free method. And this is the little trans block turbo um, LASIK sell quite a few of these every year, and this allows you to do very quick transfers for your protein, for your transfers. <clears throat> so you visualize the pre-transfer gel just to make sure that everything's working properly. Then you can image the post-transfer gel to verify that all your proteins have migrated to the blot. You verify that by taking an image of the blot and lastly, you validate by using the chemi image of your target protein to detect your, your target of interest on the blot. So now we'll just have a look at normalization. So if we have a look at the first example, distribution of automobile accidents, you can see a lot of automobile accidents actually happen quite close to home. And why is that? Familiarity theory, the repetition of driving in familiar areas such as your own neighborhood plays a role in relaxed and inattentive driving, making us less likely to be vigilant in those same areas. So if we look at distribution of automobile trips by distance, you can see a lot of our trips are popping down to the shop or popping out to the vet, which is close to home. And then a lot of further trips are not as not as often as the shorter trips. And if you do a comparison of distribution of automobile accidents and trips by distance, auto accidents in blue and auto trips in red, you can see that a lot of accidents happen actually close to home because of the inattentive driving, which happens close to home because you're familiar with the area. So essentially, if you normalize the automobile accident study conclusions, drivers crash in places they drive the most. So who jumps higher, the grasshopper or the, this is a Colombian athlete, a high jumper. So the, the grasshopper can jump 20 inches and the human can jump eight feet one and a quarter inches. 
but when you normalize to the height of the grasshopper, it's one inch, and the human is six feet three inches. So normalization, the grasshopper can jump 20 times of its its body length, whereas the human can only jump 1.3 times its height. So who jumps higher? Obviously the grasshopper. Now here we're just looking at normalization in Western blotting using housekeeping proteins. And these are just some nominal values that have been added um, to this image. So if I was to say, ask which, so we're normalizing B, C, and D to lane A. So if I was to ask you, which one do you think had the most protein, you would probably say B. But that could have been because the extraction procedure you did on the samples was just work better. Or you may have loaded slightly more protein in that example. So now we can say, okay, in lane A, we've got target three, housekeeping protein at three, normalized at three. And if we look at which lane has the most protein compared to the housekeeping loading control, it's actually D. Because you take two divided by three divided by two times three to give you 4.5. One divided by three is 0.33 times three is one. So that's using housekeeping proteins. And then we do again, this is normalization in Western blotting using total protein normalization. So we're comparing the total protein in the stain-free blot with the target protein in image lab software. And here you can see stain-free total protein loading control. So that's the, um, on the blot, total protein that is run. <laughs> and again, you can see that D actually contains most of the protein. So now we're going to look at loading controls, housekeeping proteins versus total protein normalization. So in the traditional workflow, if you're using housekeeping proteins, when you get to the end, you actually have to strip and reprobe so that you can target your housekeeping proteins. But with total protein normalization, you don't need to do that. You run your gel, you take an image, you do the transfer, you take an image of the post-transfer gel, and then you take an image of your stain-free blot. And then you can use your, do your immunodetection, which can take uh, a little while to do. But you stripping and reprobing for housekeeping proteins, strip and reprobe for housekeeping with chemiluminescence, loss of protein every time you strip. Some antibodies are hard to strip completely and alternative is to run two blots, which adds further complexity. So you can see on D on the right, there was no stripping of the antibody, antitubulin, and the lanes there are a little bit darker than the lanes which were stripped in C. So this is also looking at transparency. So a lot of journals do have algorithms which they use to look at imaging, images especially of Western blot data. And here you can see um, some papers had duplications, stretches, exposure adjustments, or flips are all visible in figure three of this paper. So images were used previously and then reused later on. And then at the bottom here, you can see a lane re reassortment in this paper published the year after. And here you can see in 2006, SSI, SI, SCR, and SI flip. 2006, that same image was used in 2009. And lastly, some people were was, was seen doing splicing and pasting images from previous run results into later publications.
So now we're going to look at the linear dynamic range of stain-free total protein normalization. And on the left, you can see images, 2.5 micrograms to 80 and 1 microgram to 20. So the linear dynamic range is the signal intensity on a blot proportionally increase with the increase in protein load. Stain-free gels provide a wide linear dynamic range. And you can see on the left, as the protein concentration is increasing, it is increasing linear, linearly. Sorry for that. I think I filled that uh, linearly. So the linear dynamic range provided by stain-free technology for total protein measurements, lysate dilutions, and the first gel, 2.5 to 80 micrograms total protein, and below in B, one microgram to 20 micrograms of protein. And you can see that the, there's a large dynamic range with the, with the total protein normalization. So, So you get you need to be able to get uh, linear linear linearity with your gels as you increase this the protein load. So here you can see stain free technology eliminates signal normalization issues for accurate protein quantification. No proportional increase in signal generated for housekeeping proteins. Why? Because housekeeping proteins are often expressed at a high level. So the total density for each lane is measured from the stain-free blot and a lane profile is obtained. So if you have a look here, stain-free blot image, it's going up nicely linearly. And these ones here for the beta actin, the beta tubulin and the gap DH, you can often saturate out your images and so they're not linearly expressed. So here we're looking at housekeeping proteins, differential expression, housekeeping changes in pathological tissues. So we've got wild type mice and spinal muscular atrophy mice. And what you should see is that the is that the uh, actin and tubulin should be around should be the same in the wild type and this and the spinal muscular atrophy mice. But here you can see actins dropped 20% and tubulin has dropped 7.5%. So the housekeeping genes are not behaving like housekeeping proteins in the wild type and the diseased mice. Housekeeping protein differential expression across different tissues. So here you can have a look at beta actin variability across different tissue types. And you can see here, total protein is in red. Obviously there was some different um, extraction procedures done on the different tissues, but total protein is staying very similarly, and but actin is changing quite a lot in the different tissues. And here we have housekeeping protein differential expression. So there's um, sciatic nerve in a mouse and actin and NFL expression differences in proximal or distal sciatic nerve regions in SMA mice. And then the first one you can see the total protein stays the same, but actin has decreased just by looking at the proximal or distal areas. And NFL has, so the total protein stays the same, but NFL has changed drastically between proximal and distal as well. So you have to be very careful using housekeeping proteins for differential expression. So here is a journal of clinical investigation. An inauspicious start in 2009, unfortunately. This issue may seem a little thinner than others. We've recently published as four, partic four articles that were previously accepted and scheduled for publication in this issue will not appear. 
We continue to screen all figures from accepted manuscripts, and we continue to find irregularities. In several cases, the alterations in the figures led to the discovery of some fundamental problems with the data. They've gone further to say it is typically better to normalize Western blots using total protein loading as the denominator. All righty, now we're going to have a look at the stain-free total protein normalization simulation. Um, so you're going to be using the stain-free blot for total protein normalization. So not the gel, but the stain-free blot. And then you're also going to use the chemi blot of your target protein. So how to use total protein to normalize your target protein? We'll cover that in the next few slides. And Image Lab software is free to download off the BioRed website, but you just need to register on the website and then you can download Image Lab software for free. So here we have an image of a gel viewing the stain-free blot in 3D and highlights the intensity of the signal in the marker lane. So we're just looking at the marker lane because if we were looking at a normal lane, there would be a whole lot of other proteins around. So you can see that certain bands are very well expressed, 36.1, 19.4, 19 19.1, .1, and some other proteins are expressed at lower levels. And these little blue lines on either side of the lane, you can adjust them as you need, but um, the area under the curve is giving you the total protein and minus the gray level at the bottom, that's the background. So you can um, visualize the volume or the volume, the intensity within an area in that plot, in that protein. So now we are annotating the stain-free blot. So normalizing, just for this example, we're just normalizing lane seven versus lane two. So lane two is actually sample number one and lane seven, seven is actually sample number six. And we're using the image lab software is used to draw the lanes around the well, the lanes. Um, when you're doing total protein normalization, you will have, so there is a simulation mode that you can use in image lab software and that automatically draws the lanes for you. But when you're doing uh, total protein normalization, you will have to draw the own lanes. And um, there is a video on YouTube in the BioRad Laboratories channel to show you how to do that. So now we're calculating the normalization factor. So we're looking in lane two. We've got the total protein um, run on the gel and the, on the blot. And then we've got a gray background beneath that. So in lane two, the adjusted lane volume, the area under the curve is 141,000. In lane seven, the adjusted lane volume is actually 81,000. So we've actually got more protein in lane two than in lane seven. So what do we do? So we're looking at the normalization factor. So in lane two, we divide 141,000 by 141,000 and we get one. For lane seven, we divide 141,000 by 81,000 and we get a normalization factor of 1.74, and that normalization factor we are going to use later um, when calculating the target protein in your chemiluminescent image. So there's the chemiluminescent image. It's also got lanes drawn around it, and we're comparing lane seven to lane two, sample one to sample six. So here you can see, um, I'll just go back. So we're looking at the target protein now in lane seven and lane two. So you can see the adjusted lane volume 
for the area under the curve minus background is 21.9 thousand and in lane seven adjusted band volume is 22.9 so they're very similar in size but we what we need to do is now use the normalized volume so we times one times times one is equal to 21.9 thousand in lane two and in lane seven, we've got the 1.74 normalized volume. We need to times that by 22.9 and we get a 39.8 thousand. So there's actually more protein in lane seven than there is in lane two. So you can actually export your data to Excel and you can draw graphs if you're doing a presentation or for publication purposes. So what I'm going to show you now is a video just looking at total protein normalization in image lab software. Okay, so we go to file, we click new single channel, blots, stain-free blot, so we select that, there's our stain-free block. Then we go to file again, new single channel protocol. We hit on select, we go to blots, the chemi blot we're going to use. So now we've got these two images and now we need to merge them. So we go to file, create multi-channel image and we select stain-free blot and the Western blot in the other one. And now you get three gels. And if you click on RGB, you will be able to just see the two gels. So you make them a little bit bigger. And then we go to lanes. You select stain free blot, as with the one we're comparing to. And we draw our lanes around the, this is in simulation mode. So we've got, and then we say we want to compare to lane number two, total protein normalization. And if we click on that, we get the normalized volume for all these, all the lanes in the gel. So 1.7, 1 1.3, 1 1.3, 2.3, 0.98. So a little bit less than in two. Then we can export that to export, I mean to Excel, and we can highlight it, go to graphs, and draw a graph. And then you can export that into a presentation or into a, an article that you're writing. So just a reminder again that they are under the image lab software, there are video tutorials on the Biorad Laboratories website in YouTube that show you how to do there's a, a short version and a longer version which shows you how to do total protein normalization on YouTube. So now we're going to have a look at some reagents for stain free. So we've got the TJX stain-free fast cast kits. It's a simple protocol. You mix and you pour everything together. It's ready in 30 minutes. <clears throat> it runs in 15 to 20 minutes at 300 volts. Stain-free enabled, saves time and minimizes leakage issues, etc. And you get the checkpoints to confirm protein separation. Then you get the TJX stain-free precast gels. They're pre-made, tris glycine extended life but they need to be stored at four degrees they're pre-made saves time long shelf life saves money runs in 15 to 20 minutes and saves time and minimizes leakage issues and they're also stain free enabled then there's a whole lot of mini protein tgx precast gels and mini protein tgx stain free Precast gel. So you can buy the option which is non stain free. 
and you get 10 well, 10 well, 50 microliters, 30 microliters, 12 well, 20 microliters, 15 microliter wells, 15 microliters, etc. And then there is a guide on the website which shows you. So if you're looking at the 6.5, um, it would be better to use the 4 to 20% or the 8 to 16% if you're looking at a small protein. <clears throat> the Transblock Turbo, as you can see, it has two channels. You can run four mini or two midi gels per run. Transfer in three to 10 minutes. Efficient transfer efficiencies over a broad molecular weight range. But really, you should be using the fast gas kits and the TGX extended stain free gels. Um, saves time and increases throughput and high transfer efficiency, and able to confirm the presence of air bubbles. Transplot turbo transfer packs. It's already pre assembled for you. Nitrocellulose or PVDF, and flexibility and ability to reduce background. Ready to assemble kits. Uh, you can buy the PVDF membrane or low fluorescence PVDF membrane is recommended for stain-free PVDF or nitrocellulose. Saves time and flexibility and ability to reduce background. There's also a number of precision plus pre-stained standards, precision, precision plus unstained standards, and precision plus West and C standards. So you can use those, and those are all recombinant proteins, and they should be running the same every single time that you run a gel. So they are in some of the gels, uh, in the precision unstained standard and integrated strip tag sequence. So the precision plus unstained and the precision plus Western C, you can add streptagnin alkaline phosphatase, or HRP, phosphoradish peroxidase conjugate. It will bind to the um, strep tag and will, if you add the substrate, will fluoresce and you'll be able to see your marker bands on the membrane as well. Then we have every block blocking buffer, which is a five minute incubation, universal blocking buffer for Western blots, saves time. And then we have the Clarity and Clarity Max ECL substrates. Uh, clarity for routine westerns or Clarity Max for challenging blots needing higher sensitivity. And then on the imaging side, we have the Chemidoc MP imaging system. Where you can get a white tray coming with it, a blue tray, UV st a safety shield for Chemidoc MP and Chemidoc imaging systems and gel alignment templates. So we also have the Chemidoc and the Chemidoc MP. Power supply is the basic power supply. Mini pro protein tetracell for mini precast gels, which can take four gels vertically at a time. Mini protein, protein TGX um, stain-free precast gels and buffers 10 times trisglycine SDS and four times Langley sample buffer. We also have the blotting system, which is the transblot turbo transfer starter system in every blot blocking buffer in the 500 mils. And then protein standards, all blue standards, unstained standards, Western C pack as well. And then the Clarity Western ECL substrate as well. So if you look at the stain-free ecosystem, Biorad supplies a whole lot of consumables for Western blotting. It supplies the imaging systems, the Chemidoc and the Chemidoc MP, and it also allows you to download the Image Lab software straight from the Biorad website. All you need to do is just register on the website. So this is just the family of BIRAD imaging systems. The Chemidoc, Chemidoc XRS Plus has been discontinued. So I just left it in just to say that it's been discontinued. Um, the Gel Doc Go doesn't have any chemiluminescence or 
fluorescence detection, but it can be used in a molecular lab to take images of gels. It can also be used to take images of proteins. So if you're doing TMB or 4CN substrates, which produce a precipitate on the blot, then you can use that to image your blots as well. And they're all stain-free enabled. So the Joel Dark Go doesn't have chemiluminescence function at the moment. Uh, the Chemidoc does do chemiluminescence and the Chemidoc MP for fluorescence and chemiluminescence detection. And then just having a look at the Chemidoc MP. So it's providing the sensitivity of film without the hassles of film processing or darkroom chemicals. I used to do darkroom chemicals back in the day, but that gives my age away, so I won't say when I did that. You don't get confused, uh, don't get confused by specs, get impressed by, by the performance. Our expert sales team at LASIK is happy to demo the Chemidoc MP on site. You can upgrade the Chemidoc system to the Chemidoc MP and expand the detection capabilities from chemiluminescence to multi, uh, multi fluorescence. There are nine different light sources contained within with seven emission filters, providing best flexibility for current and future applications. You can build from scratch based on over 25 years of expertise in the field of Western blotting from Biorad. And the Chemidoc MP is part of our stain-free Western blot workflow, providing the most accurate Western blot data in less time. <coughs> so stain-free enabled, check your Western work blot workflow easily and validate your results correctly. Yeah. Flexibility, no limitations on current and future applications. Superior performance, get trustful data with no compromise on sensitivity and data quality. Ease of use, spend your time on interpreting results rather than image acquisition and analysis. And Western blot expertise, we are here to support you in getting the most out of your pressure samples. So marketing collateral. So Biorad does have a Western Blot University and I can share this slide with LASIK so they can pass it on to you. So the Western Blot University is enables you to go and do a number of courses that are about 40 minutes each. There is a troubleshooting um, link as well. On YouTube, under, under the Biorad Laboratories Corporation, there are two videos for total protein normalization. The one is about three minutes and the other one is about nine minutes, I think. And then lastly, we have the Biorad Academy. So if you go to HTTPS semicolon um, colon academy.birad.com, they will find a whole lot of videos going through encompassing Western blot, gene expression, digital PCR, bioplex, immunoassays, and flow cytometry. So that's a really good resource, and it's um, free to, to use as well. So you can spend less time preparing gels and use less sample, complete the workflow in less time, identification of problems at critical control points in advance, spend less on gels, membrane consumables, and antibodies, ECL, et cetera, because you're reducing repeats. Most expensive uh, experiment in science is a repeat. You can get highly sensitive fluorescent gel and membrane images with low background without using any stain and staining, and you can produce less waste. You spend less and get and publish the best. So you see a stain-free blot from step four, from normalization, total protein detection with fluorescence, or you can continue to use chemiluminescence for total protein detection. And this is just showing you if you use a trisglycine extended stain-free precast gel, it'll take you about three and a half hours to do Western blot. TGX stain-free fast cast kit will take about four hours 
and the handmade job is taking about 11 hours. So what would you like to do if you had the chance of spending six hours less a day on Western blotting? I'm sure your supervisor would like to think that you'd be doing, be doing your thesis work and searching for international literature, but you could decide to drink more coffee, to play some table tennis, library time, TikTok time, going to the theatre. So that's come to the end of the presentation. I just want to thank everyone who attended. Thank you very much for uh, attending today, and we hope you found this presentation useful.